But if we get in there and things don't look, you know, like if, if, if you need a reconstruction because this suddenly doesn't look like what we think we're going to see based on the imaging we have, et cetera, then we may need to do a full-blown reconstruction. So, you know, guys tell me, I talked to Rich Hill quite a bit um, last year when they were just getting ready to start the season and he wasn't, he wasn't ready to be in competition yet, but he was almost there. And, uh, you know, the thing when they wake up is like, okay, what, do, what did we have done? Because they know that the potential to come back sooner is, <laughs> right. is there if they had the internal brace. But um, the success with the procedure is remarkable. But uh, as I said, uh, Dr. Dugas would emphasize, and I think you see based on the people who are doing the procedure, they are guys who uh, treat a lot of baseball players. You know, this is not something yeah, of course. Um, for somebody to do who's just like, oh, I'm going to try this. Uh, because then you'll see the data skew. And, and that, it's important. Um, that's why choosing the right uh, candidates is so critical to, the, to actually having success with this. And from a and from a fantasy perspective, from a fantasy perspective, if you hear a pitcher is going for a second opinion, it's not that they may that not need Tommy John surgery. They may need may they may talk about other types of treatment they can try. Meaning they could try the Tommy John, or they can try this internal bracing, or they can try PRP injections. There are many different things that they can try, but they always want to get a second opinion to make sure they make the correct decision because these decisions can cost players millions of dollars. So they have to make the right decision for themselves, for their family. They have to make them the, the correct decision for the organization. The organization usually should be on board with this as well. And when it comes to fantasy, when you hear someone's going for second opinion, that's usually a very, very bright red flag thinking that, okay, they, they were told something, they don't like it that much, and they're trying to get a second opinion thinking, okay, maybe I can, instead of being out 16 to 18 months, I can be out uh, 10 to 14 months, something like that. I would say though, I, I, I do, I, I would follow that by saying that when you get to the elite um, orthopedists who work in baseball, who do the procedures, because really uh, it's a small number and they're, they're pretty collegial. It's not uncommon for guys to get two or even three opinions because it, number one, it's supported by, um, you know, the, uh, the CBA. Um, so uh, you know, team can have their opinion, player can seek another. And if they want a third opinion, it's somebody that's mutually agreed upon by the two parties. It's also really well supported by the physicians. Like they actually encourage it because if I imagine if a guy goes and hears the same thing three times, he may still come back to the first guy to get whatever the treatment approach is. But um, think about how much time they're potentially missing uh, with a major injury. And so it, it's actually smart to get multiple opinions. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it, 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 I don't think it's always a bad thing. It may signal that it's something serious, but I don't think the act of seeking multiple opinions is a bad thing. And these guys tend to, um, they may have different approaches in terms of the procedure. For example, the way uh, Dr. David Alchek operates on someone is slightly different than the way that Dr. Neil Elitrash does in LA. But essentially, they both have great outcomes and they've seen tons of baseball players. So um, it, it's it's interesting that the perception is sometimes worse or, you know, oh, this is terrible. They must be really, they must really not, uh, you know, they didn't like the guy they saw first. And that's not always the case. Right. There are three uh, pitchers, big name pitchers, that are due to come back from Tommy John surgery this year: Chris Sale, Noah Syndergaard, Luis Severino. Most projections have them at about seventy-five to eighty-five innings pitched. Um, question to you, Stefania, is you know what are the timetables between those three guys? Uh, are there any ones who are faster or slower to come back? And do you think that the seventy-five to eighty-five innings pitched is a fair number? Is it too high? Uh, is it very too high? Um, because currently, if we're doing the math of playing fantasy baseball, people are paying last, second to last, third round picks to get a Noah Syndergaard. But projections having them in half a season almost is a pretty good bargain to to pick up for an elite player. Do you think that uh, people are wise not to pick them up? And what's your general take on the three players? 
Uh, it's a little all over the map. Um, and, and Syndergaard, I think one of the things I look at is what are, where are they in their throwing program? What's going on? And the fact that he was just cleared to throw breaking pitches, like that tells you something. He's doing well, you know, in, in addition to throwing fastballs, he's now moving into breaking pitches. And that's a progression. That's an advancement of your throwing program. And so he looks pretty good to be on track for coming back in June. You know, they moved him to the 60-day IL, no, no surprise. Um, but I think he's in a really good position. Now, again, people need to remember, you can always have setbacks. And sometimes those setbacks don't happen until they're starting to pitch in a game. And, and by a setback, that could be something as minors developing a little bit of soreness Again, because you're doing an activity you haven't done in, in a year or, or longer, usually, um, it's not the end of the world. It, it doesn't necessarily mean a negative thing, but they're going to pull a player back if they start to get uncomfortable or, or what have you. And it doesn't even have to be the elbow. It could be something else. It could be something in their shoulder. And so they, they will scale them back. But as of right now, Syndergaard looks to me like he's going to offer the most um, – bang for the buck in fantasy because he has the earliest target. Chris Sale, who had surgery not far removed from the time that Syndergaard did, um, had some neck stiffness that actually pushed him back again. Like I said, doesn't have to be the elbow. Um, nothing major, but nonetheless, they're going to be very smart with him. So, you know, he's still throwing on flat ground. That's very different than what Syndergaard is doing. Um, and, and I think the last I heard what uh, Alex Cora was hinting at was, you know, late summer, I think were the words they used, which I don't know what that means in baseball. You know, <laughs> does that mean like August or does that mean the end of September? But to me, I think what they are probably looking at at this point is it'd be nice to get Chris Sale back into competition. And hey, if they're making a run for it, Maybe he's somebody who's available late in the year, but for fantasy purposes, I certainly wouldn't be counting on him because they're going to protect him. And then Severino, I, I, I feel the same way. You know, they're, they're talking about him coming back um, a little bit later in the, in the year. He's getting ready to start throwing off a mound, but he hasn't been throwing off a mound yet. Um, so he's a little bit behind, but remember he had multiple injuries over the last three years. So Again, there's, they're going to be careful with him and his recovery. And I, I think the one you can look at as being the closest to being productive is Syndergaard. Right. And, and Ruvain, um, you know, just a little, little bit of follow-up on that. Um, you know, how, how close is Noah Syndergaard going to be to his usual level throughout the season? Is it worth, if you're in the NFBC in a 15-team league, to uh, have a spot for him, being that in the NFBC there's only seven bench spots, no IL? Uh, is, is that a worthwhile spot to uh, roster? Um, I'm I'm very questioning that because the fact that the IL the, the bench was in an NFPC with 15 teams, but it's only seven people on the bench. Uh, Noah Syndergaard is not going to be back at least until June, so it's at least two months that you're going to have a dead spot on your roster. Now, if he comes back in June, that's great. But a lot of times, after p players come back from this type of injury, the thing that doesn't come back to them right away is velocity and is command. So if, if he can if he can harness those two things early on, then 100% he's worth rostering because he will probably, he may not be throwing 100 miles an hour right away. Now, there's there are exceptions to the rule that it takes some time for players to throw 100 miles an hour. It was, I think it was you Darvish, not you Darvish, um, um, Shoei Otani. He, he just said this past week that he was throwing 100 miles an hour uh, in, uh, in, a, in a bullpen session. So that's great for him. But look how far along he is in his recovery. Syndergaard, I think he's going to be the first one back. You'll probably get, the, just like Stefania said, she hit it on the nail. You'll probably get the most out of Syndergaard. Whether it's going to be the Syndergaard before the surgery or after the surgery, it's going to be completely up to how he progresses and how he's able to get his velocity back up with repetition and how he's able to see how he control how he gets his control. As for Chris Sale, again, Stefania hit it on the head toward the end of the season. I'm, I'm thinking even July, end of July, beginning of August, or even the end of August. That's what it sounds like. I think Severino is probably going to come back sooner because Severino is, Severino is supposed to throw off the mound in about two weeks. Um, and he did have Tommy John before Chris Sale and Syndergaard, but because of his multiple injuries, he will take longer. So of all the players 
you'll probably get the most fantasy value from Noah Syndergaard. But from where he's going right now in drafts, I don't think he's worth it unless you can find someone who's going to replace him, who's going to fill in that hole for those two months. Uh, quickly about uh, two more players, Jordan Hicks, Michael Kopech. These are two players with a little bit more time since their surgery. Jordan Hicks, we know, throws those crazy 101-mile-an-hour pitches. Kopech uh, was back but opted out for last season entirely. Um, are, are we uh, to expect something good out of these two players? Can Jordan Hicks become the closer in St. Louis, which is a pretty big fantasy question. He was the man before his injury. What, what do you think, Stefania? Yeah, I think, you know, the extra time is their friend, right? Um, and he uh, he he also probably made a good decision, uh, Jordan Hicks did, to uh, not pitch last year, um, being a type 1 diabetic. You know, there are other, other um, reasons to hold out for 2020. Um, but since he had his surgery in June of 2019, he's approaching – the two year mark. And I think, um, you know, they've already said that he looked good in his early throwing and he, it was very positive for him. But as we talked about in the beginning, when they get to competition, yeah. sometimes things change. So, uh, you know, stay tuned right. for that. And same with Kopech. Um, it's really about you know, he's a little different in terms of his style and, and being a little bit all over the place. And they may want to just watch how he does when he's um, <clears throat> when he's facing live hitters to see what they what they think in terms of how they utilize him. But again, time in terms of the healing and the recovery for him is his friend. So question about if you're in, let's say you're in season and you hear that your pitcher has a fantasy, in fantasy has an elbow strain. I know you're a fantasy player. Um, what do you do with that information? Somebody <laughs> has a, an elbow strain, goes on the IL, you know, uh, he's on there for a couple days for sure. How long do you hold this person until you drop them before you hear the actual information about surgery, right? The question is what to do with these players that you don't have a definitive idea about their prognosis. Yeah, it's tough, right? Because um, if I hear something like elbow strain is such a garbage term, it doesn't really tell you anything about what's going on. Some teams are more revealing than others. It's just like, you know, in every sport we see this, some are more forthcoming with information than others. Sometimes I appreciate that they're holding out because they want the player to get the opinions and the information he deserves before they go public with it. So I, I understand that. I don't have a problem with it. It's when it's never updated, it's just sort of left like this generic uh, term that really doesn't mean anything because a strain, you know, is a muscle or a tendon, but a sprain is a ligament. So sometimes there's a little hint depending on which term they use, but they don't always use them correctly. So you can't rely too much on that. I, If I'm a fantasy player and what I tell people all the time is for any injury, just try and dig for the details, whoever's got them. If there's a beat writer who's reporting, um, whatever the details or nuances are that they can get from the team or the player. Because for example, in the elbow, if you find out that a guy has medial elbow pain versus lateral, so the inner side of the elbow versus the outside of the elbow, I'm way more concerned about the inner aspect of the elbow, which is where the um, ulnar collateral ligament is, uh, and the flexor tendon, both of which can be problematic. They're both subject to the stress from throwing. Um, when guys have flexor tendon injuries, it's often a precursor uh, to a an, an UCL tear. Um, and it's reflecting that there's stress on the medial side of the elbow. But the lateral side of the elbow, usually it is a, a tendonitis. Sometimes it's a grip thing. Guys who are gripping too tight, um, for whatever reason, um, start to develop a strain there in their extensor mechanism. It, that's not necessarily as bad. And sometimes uh, you'll also see guys who are complaining of pain on the back side of the elbow, you know, right, right, right where the elbow joint is on the back side. And guys who've pitched for a long time, develop spurs, things like that. Uh, you hear about guys getting scopes to get a bone spur out or get debris out of the joint. That's not uncommon for a pitcher. Over time, you're going to have a little bit of wear and tear. Those things don't alarm me nearly as much. So any details you can listen for or seek out in the reporting can help you be a little more astute about how concerned you should be and what kind of moves you should make in fantasy. 
And I, I actually want to add on to that. Um, another thing you should listen out for is what type of treatment they're recommending. Are they recommending six six weeks rest? Are they recommending a PRP injection? Uh, what a P, uh, for people who don't know what a PRP injection is, for the for the layman's terms, they actually take your blood, they spin it down, they take out the good stuff, and they insert it right back into the tendon area in the hopes that it will help strengthen the tendon and make it strong again so they can try to avoid any type of surgery. If you hear that, that's actually a good thing because that means they're trying to do everything they can and hopefully they can try to avoid any type of surgical procedure. 